Good afternoon. Uh, let's go. All right. Oh, sorry. Food. We eat food. We enjoy food. We need food constantly. Unfortunately, the food production ecosystem across the world is suffering tremendous challenges. Here in Australia, we heard many times already, keynote speakers, that we are suffering one of the worst drought in Australia. Recently, Time Magazine mentioned early this year how bad farmers are facing this challenge. I read and I was really moved by one of the farmers mentioning you can work as hard as you want. You can pray as much as you want, but still won't rain. Now, if you consider that pretty soon, by 2050, we're going to reach 10 billion people living in this planet, and we heard also that the food production will need to increase around 40, 60 percent. The question is, what are we going to do? Of course, we need to think about environmental footprint. Obviously, we cannot keep doing what we are doing in the way that we are doing it. We need to think about the food efficiency, the food efficiency in our system, which means, very simple, how much we are putting in, how much we are getting out, and what is the impact of that on the environment? Because now we cannot deny that we are not just certainly standing in the food chain. If we impact the system, it will bounce back to us immediately. So my name is Antonio Castillo. I'm an aquaculture engineer from Chile, and I'm the director of Biotech Bridge. So in Chile, Aquaculture is one of our major driving forces of our economy. We are world leaders in the salmon industry with salmon, trout, sea urchin, and mussel. So it's a very important industry for us. It has been successful, and also we face many challenges as well. Now, what I do with my company, basically I bridge Australia with Chile and Israel because there are many challenges that they have similarity across the spectrum, and we can embrace those opportunities to leverage and collaborate and bring solutions. We heard so many times, we make problems, we can facilitate solutions. A little bit of the program, just to, to have a little bit of a structure. So we're going to follow with each of the panelists giving a very brief introduction about themselves, and I specifically ask them, try to give us some you know, organic insight about who you are, why you, I mean, who you are, what you do, and why aquaculture. Then after that, we will have uh, the panel where we basically, we're gonna try, we're gonna discuss three major themes, market opportunity for the industry, the challenges, and of course, sustainability and innovation. And then we will open the panel to the audience, and we want you to be the players here the essential player, because we are not here for ourselves. We want to bring you in. We want to hear your questions, your concerns, because you are the consumer and you have power. You determine the market, and also you need to gain that insight in order to you, for you to make the right decisions. So first, I would like to call Samantha. Thanks, Antonio. You're going to do the slides? Um, so, first question, who am I? Well, I'm an aquaculturist, I'm a marine biologist, I'm a dive master, a turtle tour guide, a fisherwoman, an auntie to three gorgeous nephews, and a, and a fourth one that was just born on the weekend, and a dog mum. Um, I was born and raised in the best part of the world, which is the Northern Territory, and my full-time job is an aquaculture research scientist at the Darwin Aquaculture Centre. Next slide. Thank you. So what do you do? For the last five years, I've been working with Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory to develop tropical rock oyster aquaculture, specifically the black lip rock oyster, which is a native species to Northern Australia. It's also a new species to aquaculture. 
So this project originated from traditional owners who are interested in farming oysters to provide economic opportunities on country. The project has been running for about 10 years now and some recent research success has meant that the farms were able to expand from trial farms of hundreds of, of thousands of oysters into small scale commercial farms of hundreds of thousands of oysters. Uh, and why aquaculture? Well, put simply, I love the ocean. I love studying marine biology, but aquaculture really is a breath of fresh air. Aquaculture can provide solutions to some of our biggest problems, such as overfishing and feeding the world quality protein. I'm particularly passionate about community-based aquaculture because it can provide benefits where they are needed most. I believe that at our core, we all want to make a difference with the time that we have on this planet. And for me, positively contributing to community-based aquaculture is a worthwhile pursuit. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. Uh, please, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm uh, Jonathan Lilly. I'm the uh, director of uh, Yumba. Um, Abalone, we've been farming abalone since 1999. How did I get into farming abalone? I'm from the agribusiness, actually the wool industry, and in the 90s wool wasn't doing so well. And uh, being a, a keen spear fisherman all my life, I've always had a bit of an attraction to the sea. And aquaculture was something that I thought was quite futuristic. So I rang up a marine biologist friend of mine in Tasmania, and uh, I said, uh, show me around, you know, so I was thinking salmon or something like that or trout. And he took me to uh, a fledgling abalone, pilot commercial abalone farm in Bishino, Tasmania. Uh, we didn't own that farm then, but we do now. Um, yeah, so I've had uh, over 20 years in the game and I'm enjoying it. I fundamentally did it as an alternative uh, form of income. Um, but since I've been involved with aquaculture, I've learned so much more about it and uh, its ability uh, to sort of feed the world. I mean, you've got the sea covers 70% of the, of the world mass and uh, we have an enormous opportunity to be growing protein in the sea and very effectively. So, yeah, I've turned into sort of an investor, more interested in the bottom line to very much a passionate aquaculturalist. I'm Melbourne-based as well but I travel around the countryside a bit. We have farms in, in uh, three states, South Australia, uh, Tasmania and Victoria. We do about 700 tonnes per annum and we also hatch oysters for the South Australian industry. Is that it? We're, okay, we're away. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, now, please, welcome Paul Harrison. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Paul Harrison from Mainstream Aquaculture. Uh, so we're going to shift here from uh, Abalone to Barramundi. Mainstream uh, is a Melbourne-based, Melbourne-headquartered uh, business that I founded with, some, with three others uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, we're a vertically integrated company. We have a hatchery uh, located here in, in Melbourne where we do a lot of the selective breeding. We provide barramundi fingerlings through to the industry within Australia and to 24 countries around the world. We also have farming operations 
uh, here in Melbourne and in Queensland. And we have um, some presence in the supply channel as well. So we uh, are trying to cover all aspects of the, uh, the Barramundi supply chain. Uh, myself, I was a marine biologist, a scientist um, prior to uh, this venture. Uh, I had a, a real interest in, in doing something commercial and uh, spent about 10 years really ma as managing director of mainstream in its formative years, handed the reins on to a, a CEO and CFO and I have a, a much more, uh, I guess, pleasant and enjoyable role now where I'm chief scientist and manage the innovation program for mainstream. Um, this is our plant about 30 minutes away uh, from here in, in Werribee. Uh, it was commissioned two years ago. Uh, we've really uh, positioned ourselves as leaders in land-based, highly efficient aquaculture technology. And uh, this plant is now operating and, and um, putting out uh, just under 1,000 tonnes a year of, of barramundi. Uh, we're also working, there was a, a public announcement recently on quite an exciting feasibility um, project at the moment to see if uh, we can replicate this plant, but ten times larger uh, in uh, in the Gippsland region. So we can talk about that later. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Now, Tim, please. Okay, thank you. Um, my name's Tim Dempster. I'm an academic at the University of Melbourne. Um, this is uh, my laboratory, so this is uh, the group of people that I've, I've worked with over the past few years. They're students and collaborators um, here and abroad. We... We, as our starting point, go out and find the industry's biggest problems, whether they be with environmental sustainability or with production, and often those two are linked. So we start by finding big problems, and then we try and work out what we can do in that space to help fix some of those problems. So we, we invent new, we take some of the methods they're using, we tweak them, we see if we can get them to work better, or we just invent entirely new ways for uh, fish farmers, not unlike these guys here, or abalone and fish as we have here, and, and try and get try and make new techniques and technology. So we're in the innovation space uh, and the research space. We do a lot of our work with uh, big salmon all around the world here in Australia and in Norway. And just in this example, this little creature here is the greatest problem for salmon farming in the world. It's a little uh, parasite on the skin probably costs uh, one to two billion dollars for the industry to control every year and it, it stops them from expanding. So we do an enormous amount of work uh, trying to find ways to, to trick this parasite into not infecting the fish. So we're into preventative technologies rather than control. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. And that's, that's what thank our you. lab does. Yeah. yeah, put it over there. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that brief introduction. And now we're just going to dive in, since we want to be within the theme of the waterhole and aquaculture, we're going to dive in into the key issues that we want to address today. So um, the first question that uh, I would like to ask to the panel is that I'm talking about there is a uh, market opportunity. And the frank question is, is it really there a market opportunity for our industry? And if there is, uh, if you can dive a little bit of, give me more information about, you know, is this a transient opportunity, how big it is? So I open to, perhaps, you know, we can start from people from the industry, and then um, we can, you know, alternate and contribute in each of the angles, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'd probably answered it at two levels, the, the macro level and then the local domestic uh, market level. I think it's a really uh, interesting, interesting and exciting time for food production and, um, and certainly aquaculture. Uh, you know, at a macro level, uh, we have population growth going on. We have enormous growth uh, in Asia, for instance. We also see a trend where uh, the diets uh, in some of the, the, the poorer countries or the third world countries are changing, where uh, they were predominantly you know, rice or plant-based diets and, and as the middle class gets larger, they're demanding more and more protein-based uh, diets. That puts some real pressure on, on the world to produce protein efficiently. Um, and aquaculture provides a very good solution for that. But mm -hmm. So at a macro market driving level, what we see is increased population growth, or increased population, and in addition to that, a, an increased demand in the proportion of protein within those diets. Mm -hmm. um, locally, 
we're also seeing recently, particularly in the last 10 years, a real surge in um, public awareness about food. I think things like MasterChef and so forth have made, made people um, a lot more savvy about food, caring about food, asking a lot of questions about food, how it's made, is it sustainable, mm -hmm. how can we trace it, et cetera, et cetera. And so, at least for our business, we've found that mm -hmm. our market opportunities mm -hmm. have increased significantly mm -hmm. um, through being able to provide a consistent product in a, in a, from a controlled mm -hmm. um, uh, farming environment. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think there's just as much merit in some of these small scale uh, niche opportunities as well as the really large scale um, intensive production. Especially, I mean, in the tropics, when you're thinking about the future, by 2050, the tropics will hold most of the world's people and two thirds of its children. So that's something to think about when you're thinking about opportunities in aquaculture. The tropics is also fantastic for aquaculture because our water is quite warm and we have very fast growing species and highly productive environments. Um, so just on the flip side to that um, large scale intensive culture to just be thinking about the opportunities for these smaller scale uh, niche markets that can also be spread over a wider uh, distribution which means that their impacts on the environment are also less um, and then biosecurity is also improved as well when you're farming over a larger area and in smaller um, scale. Thank you. Yeah, yes, I was please. just going to add to the, the macro picture and globally we're already at a point where we eat more seafood that is farmed than we do from wild caught fisheries and wild caught fisheries have stagnated. In fact, they're sort of declining a little bit in the amount of seafood they provide us with and aquaculture is filling the void. So globally aquaculture is growing at about 5 or 6% per year. Um, we'll get to a point, I think I calculated the other day, where just aquaculture in the sea, most aquaculture is in freshwater, but aquaculture in the sea will be, oh, that's better, aquaculture in the sea will take over wild fisheries by about 2040, and at that point, 75% of the, the seafood that we eat will come from a farm source rather than a wild source, and, and that, that trend is also happening locally within Australia, the, the same kind of growth is, is there in Australian aquaculture. And Jonathan, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, market opportunity, I, I sort of mentioned before that 70% of the globe is covered with ocean. Um, you've got species, you know, these fish species are terrific converters of food, um, whether it be algae, whether it be uh, terrestrial grain-based products, they convert at a very low rate. So from a sustainability perspective, they're, you know, generally fish are a lot more sustainable than a lot of the other species that are that are going around. And I guess, you know, cattle's the obvious one and probably, uh, you know, sheep or ruminants are, are ones that are not particularly, you know, good converters of food. Um, market opportunity, I think there's a market opportunity to take some of their share of the protein market, I have no doubt. Market opportunity from, from what we're doing, uh, you know, we're an abalone farmer, so we're a very niche market and we're a luxury good. Um, we're expanding, you know, so we're going from uh, 700 tonnes to 1,700 tonnes. And we're doing that because we feel as though uh, the, the global market for, for abalone uh, has the depth to be able to take that additional 1,000 tonnes. And with the Chinese population in particular, um, the China, there's a lot of abalone grown in China, uh, very cheap abalone, but the local people eat them. But they aspire to eat Australian-produced clean green abalone. So we see a market opportunity for us with wealthier people in China taking over some of the market. There's all, there'll always be a domestic Chinese market, but for the people that are aspirational, growing their wealth, they're interested in eating mm -hmm. a better quality product. All right, thanks. So basically we heard that um, with the increasing glo uh, growth rate of the uh, globe, you know, in population, uh, demand for sustainability, functional food, healthy food, and uh, we see the industry is well placed, basically. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, in terms of the challenges, of course, uh, uh, each industry faces its own challenges, you know, internally, externally, by regulation, in order to expand. Um, I would like to ask, you know, from the different angles, from again, from the innovations uh, angle, from the um, 
entrepreneurial or um, also from the research point of view, you know, what are the major challenges? Because evident, evidently the opportunity is there. The question is how we can embrace this opportunity, um, but what are the challenges that, you know, we are going to be facing, you know, in order to achieve that goal? You can, yes, yeah, start. Yes, please. Fika. 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 Okay. That's, <laughs> we're, we're in the process of expanding and uh, we're, we're now, we've, we've had council tick off, we've had uh, EPA tick off on a large project employing, you know, hundreds of people and uh, the project is now stuck in VCAT for six months. But we're a democratic society and we have to go through these things at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, challenges as far as red tape goes, I think most of the, the governments, the local, you know, the state governments, uh, federal government probably less so, but the state governments are fairly pro-aquaculture in general. They're, they're fairly supportive of aquaculture and seeing it go ahead. They, they understand that it's uh, expanding enormously in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Equatorial Belt and probably Australia's lagging behind quite badly. Uh, we've got a lot of good areas that can grow aquaculture so there's really a, a great future for it. But you need to get the governments, the governments need to make sure that they're not, not necessarily green light but they need to be very positive with their approach to aquaculture so People are nervous to invest in aquaculture. There's a lot of biosecurity issues with it, etc. They're nervous to invest, and if they hit government red tape, they get even more nervous. All right, thanks. Anyone? Yeah, I think uh, I would agree with that. I think that um, uh, you know, in any industry, um, you also need to be aware of your social responsibilities, and uh, and one of the things. Uh, as aquaculturists, we need to be um, conscious of and aware of is waste and the management of waste. Um, some of the newer technologies now uh, give really uh, great opportunities for that, but then it links back with, um, you know, with, with issues around regulation. We want to be able to grow an industry. Um, net net, I guess, if you're if you're taking fish from the ocean, the same number of fish those fish are producing the same amount of waste. But when you put fish into either a cage in the ocean or a pond on land or, or tanks on, on land, you're, you're generating a, a higher concentrated waste stream uh, that needs to be managed um, effectively. And that's a role that the government plays uh, very well. And so I think it's a fine balance. I think that, um, you know, I agree, I think we all agree that we're, there's not a, a, a sort of a desire for a green light to to go developing, but there has to be a balance between, um, uh, you know, sensible uh, and and effective environmental management and an ability for an industry like mm. agriculture to be able to grow. Okay. Yes. Please. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges in northern Australia and and also much of the tropics is the remoteness of where we are. Uh, and the infrastructure. So when you're farming species, fresh seafood products that need to get to market in a certain amount of time, um, that's a big challenge. Uh, pollution, not so much. It's one of the most pristine areas um, in the world. But there's a, definitely a place for innovation to play in that processing of your product and also different uh, processing methods so or different product development so that you can have longer shelf life um, and longer storage of your seafood products. Mm -hmm. I guess I can just add an addendum to, to yours, um, Paul, in that there are, there are really lots of new innovative technologies to deal with waste streams, and you sort of alluded to some where you actually grow a secondary crop which has value in the waste stream of your first crop. So it's sort of this uh, integrated management. So you're doing um, multi-trophic aquaculture. So you're growing two mm -hmm. species at once where the second species thrives in the waste stream from the first species, and then you end up with water exiting the farm that is very, very low in nutrients. And there are actually approaches um, that are in place currently in, you know, say, the prawn farms that, uh, that have exit points where their water is going into the Great Barrier Reef where they have very, very low thresholds for nutrients and they're implementing some of those strategies where they're growing an algal crop which then might go off to, for fertiliser or for a, uh, another, another product um, and, and dealing with their waste that way. So some of the, the innovation um, that's being worked on is, is 
fixing some of the problems in, in some of the places where we, where we have them. I'd, I'd just like to add, uh, you know, Paul touched on social licence. Um, uh, you know, and I think that aquaculture, certainly in the early days in the Northern Hemisphere and some instances in Australia has, you know, where we've seen instances where farms have, have uh, become dilapidated, they haven't been able to make money, they've ended up with in infrastructure washed up on beaches and things like that. Very bad. <laughs> you know, this, this ends up creating bad publicity. However, you know, if we can be responsible about that and have some sort of funds or something that we can have remediation is a good thing. But for an example, we've got a site in Port Phillip Bay, 90 hectares, uh, where we're growing mussels. And, um, you know, so many people have come up to me and just said, how did you acquire this, this sea of mine? You know, um, you know, what are you doing here sort of thing? I said, I'm farming mussels, you know. This is, this is what we're doing. And they sort of can't believe that you've been given tenure for 20 years over a piece of sea that they used to, you know, do their activities, sail through, etc. But, you know, I think that people are really, you know, the public in general have a real trouble understanding, you know, aquaculture and the perception of it. The land is all titled. <laughs> the sea's not. So, you know, if we're going to go ahead with, with aquaculture, we need public support as well you know, to understand that it's a very good way of feeding the world protein. All right, thanks. Uh, now, touching briefly in, you know, the controversy of the industry, because of course, you know, nowadays we are inundated with information. You know, we don't like information. Now we face the other problem that we have way too much information. We are living in the area of fake news. There are a lot of, you know, activists. And one of the things that I have, uh, you know, seen is that there is a lot of information out there, but it's not curated, okay? So I'm not trying to like uh, wash off the, you know, some of the issues or the problems that the industry you know, has suffered in the past because coming from Chile, we have also some problems with the environmental, and we causing environmental impact, you know, basically collapsed, all the industry collapsed because bad management. But uh, I must also say that a lot of that information over there, you know, is like misinterpreted because they are like people who don't have the depth of the knowledge so there is a little bit of misinformation. So I wanted to ask, you know, for, from the academic point of view and from the industry point of view, you know, how are we educating the public and the consumer at the end of the day? Because the consumer, you know, now is wise enough to, you know, to read the label, try to judge, but there is a lot of, you know, misinformation. So what are you doing proactively in order to educate and bring clarity to the consumer? Because the opportunity is there, but, you know, we need to, uh, you know, find that balance and, and connect people with the industry because, of course, there is no single industry that, you know, doesn't make any problem. But, uh, you know, how can we do it or what are you doing in that respect? Uh, yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of different answers to that. The, big, the biggest one um, uh, for us is, is we talk um, clearly um, and, and in detail with our market about farming. I think we go back to, you know, even... 10 or 20 years ago uh, with fish. Farming was almost a, a, a dirty word. I know some companies who have policies that they won't refer to farming in any of their marketing uh, collateral. Uh, and, and in terms of the misinterpretation, uh, there is still um, a, a difficult thing to get by, which people believe that, that wild caught fish is simply better than farmed fish. Mm -hmm. um, not many people would probably have ever eaten a wild salmon mm -hmm. um, and don't ask a lot of questions. In, in our industry with barramundi, it's very interesting. The, the wild caught industry still exists in Australia, but it's very, very small. And the fish that are caught in a wild, in, uh, caught you know, in, in the rivers and in the, in the ocean uh, have to be stored on those boats for several days to sometimes over a week and then transported down to market. When people really go through that and they realise actually the time to market from a properly controlled farming environment mm -hmm. um, compared to the wild environment, the, the attitude can change. Yeah, well. And the other thing that we see time and time again is, is in blind taste tests, um, farming product is almost always coming up ahead of uh, wild product. And that mm -hmm. makes sense. We don't eat wild ter terrestrial animals anymore. Um, all of us still have a perception that Fish needs to be wild and swimming around in the ocean, mm -hmm. but the fact is that the best tasting mm -hmm. fish are coming from 
the best quality farms. Mm. And that's just something that we have to continue to educate um, the market, market with and mm. is one of our challenges. Mm -hmm. um, my answer is that we're not doing enough. I think the image of aquaculture is not what it should be. It's not a um, necessarily a sexy area to get into, um, and it is pretty sexy when you're in it, so <laughs> I think we need to do more. I don't want to be biased, but I agree with that observation. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Sam. Um, I, I really think, you know, there's a lot of professional activists out there, as we know, and, and you know, there's a lot of scientists that, that are interested in welfare, animal welfare, and they've got very valid points. But I really see there's not enough high-level advocacy of the aquaculture industry in general, and it annoys, you know, what out of me, because I, I see aquaculture as having a great future. Yet if you read the newspapers, and particularly the ABC is famous for it, it's all negative. It's all negative about something wrong with salmon in Tasmania. What about the good stories about aquaculture? And there's many, many good stories. Mm -hmm. So I think that we as an aquaculture industry, we need to develop a lot more there and we need to get this high level, have level adv mm -hmm. advocacy to inseminate within the public what aquaculture is and what it does and how it's a benefit mm -hmm. to the world. All right. Yeah, okay. I, my answer is fairly short. I think that good. you know the industry needs probably needs to do more in terms mm -hmm. of um, getting its good stories out there. What I have seen work well, um, mostly overseas, is increased transparency about environmental performance and, exactly. and that transparency being almost in real time. You know, as soon as things are measured, the data goes up and it's instantly available to the whole world. So there are, there are lots of places in the world that operate mm. systems and that the management system means mm. the environmental performance of each farm mm -hmm. um, goes almost up instantly in real time. And that, that drives environmental compliance. And that has assisted, that, that system has really assisted the industry uh, in terms of their interaction with society. Yeah, no, I, I agree that transparency definitely will bring people in and it can really bring clarity because, uh, you know, the best way to solve a problem is to acknowledge it, you know, put it to the public, and, you know, and bring, you know, from the scientific, academic, from all the sector, you know, like, to bring clarity and educate, so then you are better informed next time. Uh, now, in, in terms of innovation, um, do you think that innovation can really facilitate or it could be a, a tool in order to reach sustainability? You know, because you know, the industry is huge and it has a huge potential. And uh, you know, taking the position of the consumer is like, is it like, you know, oh, the, the buzzword nowadays is innovation, sustainability, you know. Are we really using it? You know, are we, is innovation, can really innovation play a role, you know, in allowing this industry to become sustainable and, you know, to bring a solution to, you know, to the, to the problem of how we're going to feed 10 billion people? So. Um, yeah, uh, sustainability. Well, you know, filter feeders, they're doing it right now. They're sustainable. Organic, too. Um, you know, very interesting and, you know, you're getting these things out in 14 months. Um, as far as land-based farms are concerned, like we, we are using a lot of electricity uh, on our farm, for example, pumping ashore, but there's, there's ways and means that we can uh, decrease our, our, uh, our, our footprint by putting in wind turbines or solar, which we're doing on the new farm we're building. So certainly there's, there's a lot of ways that you can uh, make these things more sustainable, these farms. Uh, you know, the, the way that we're feeding our, our fish as well. Um, again, the use of fish oil, fish meal can be reduced with innovation and science. And that's the, a lot of people are working on that very hard. Um, algae is an amazing story, <laughs> you know. Algae, you know, being able, you know, when you see an oyster, or the oyster business or the groper business or something like that that I've seen, it's just incredible. They start with algae and they finish with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a fish that's just so delectable to the Asian markets. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Paul, um, in terms of innovation, you know, in the introduction of, of the panel, I mentioned, you know, uh, 
we really need to think about the efficiency of the food production system. And I mentioned, you know, how much we're putting in, how much we're getting out, and what is the impact of that, you know, because each industry, you know, cattle, chicken, poultry, you know, they have different numbers. Could you give us some insight about in terms of uh, fish, you know, the aquaculture industry, how efficient or how, where it plays within the major industry in the food ecosystem? Yeah, well, to keep it sort of uh, general, not so scientific, uh, animals convert food uh, into into weight, into into body mass, and um, uh, and the great thing about aquaculture is the great thing about animals that live in water is they don't exert a lot of energy walking around, and uh, they are able to be uh, far more efficient than terrestrial animals. So one of the real advantages of aquaculture is they. Uh, the, the, the species will convert food uh, in ratios that are pretty close to one to one, 1 1.2 to one, meaning 1.2 kilograms of food to um, achieve one kilogram of growth. And th that's far more efficient than any terrestrial system. Mm -hmm. And then I do have a slide that I, we can talk yeah, to later. I think um, that it, let me see if we can get it. I think w w while we're doing that, I, I think, um, talking about a, a whole of industry innovation that's been really important um, is uh, the issue of fish meal in our diets. In the early 2000s, there was a, uh, a couple of scientific articles that raised the awareness of and ra raised the issue that as aquaculture starts to grow exponentially, uh, we're going to have a problem because fish eat fish and the diets that we were feeding back at that point effectively had about 40, 43% protein, and just about all of that protein came oh, from yeah, fish here, meal. Sorry, here is the, the slide. If you can just give, drive through a little bit, what does it mean and what are the implications in terms of like, you know, the um, efficiency of the system? Yeah, sure. So, go, yep, I'll go back, back to that. So, in terms of, th this slide is one um, uh, which has the metrics from mainstream aquaculture's land-based recirculating plant. So, it applies specifically to uh, land-based recirculation, but uh, the point here is that f uh, fish can be grown very efficiently uh, on any of the um, input metrics that, that you look at. So uh, to grow a barramundi, we use far less water um, than is used for terrestrial animals. Um, feed conversion efficiency, which I mentioned before, uh, for barramundi it is between 1.2 and 1.5 to 1, depending on the farming environment. And one of the amazing things is space uh, efficiency. One of the advantages of fish is that they uh, will swim nice and deep. So you're able to put very large production systems on very small footprints. And one of the challenges as we go forward mm -hmm. is we're going to have to produce protein more efficiently and from less available land. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things uh, oh, yeah. are very supportive for an aquaculture industry. as a system of uh, producing efficient protein. But if I could just cover off on that, the innovation around feed. Yeah. Um, in 2002, we were using feed that was essentially all fish meal, constituting the 40% um, uh, protein in our diets. Today, we're using just under 5% fish meal, and that is, a, is an innovation that's been driven by necessity mm -hmm. by the feed companies who, over the years, have found ways to reduce the fish meal in the diets, still allow us to, to achieve the good FCRs that we're achieving and have just enough fish meal to ensure that the beneficial omega-3, no. omega-6 and the fatty acids that are important for health uh, still remain in the fish. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to open the panel to the public. Please, uh, whoever has a question, uh, stand up, name, the question, and if you have a very brief, you know, framework or in terms of like, you know, context. Yes, please. Hi, my name's Tallulah. I'm from RSPCA Australia. Um, so thinking about animal welfare and challenges in the aquaculture industry, I just wondered from all of your perspectives where you're working to address potential consumer concerns. Um, for instance, you know, effective stunning at slaughter or triploid salmon use in Macquarie Harbour um, could be areas that consumers are aware of in the coming years and will probably likely demand change. So, yeah. Anyone? Yeah. 
I'm going to pass this one on. I work with oysters, which if you yeah. talk about sustainability, let's just all farm oysters. We make the water uh, cleaner than it started. Okay, right. Uh, for the question about what individually we're doing, um, uh, we're probably focusing two main areas around animal welfare. One is through the production cycle itself um, to ensure that the fish um, you know, are as comfortable and happy as they can be. It's, it's actually quite, um, quite a, a sort of self-supporting uh, process because fish live in the environment that they produce waste into. So you can't afford to create the equivalent of like a, a battery hen type scenario for fish. They just simply won't grow and, and businesses will, will not survive if they try and work that way. The other way you mentioned, and a very important one, is around slaughter. Um, and ensuring that the, at the end of the process the animals are treated as humanely as possible. And we have a number of um, projects that, that we work on there and we work actively um, with, our, with our market end as well. And, and that's where I think the education of the public and the education and needs of even, say, the big retailers, they put some important demands on the way that farming practices operate. Mm -hmm. And then just to tie back to an earlier comment I made about wild versus farmed um, fish, obviously if you have a farm that is not behaving responsibly, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. But most farms and most successful farms are behaving very responsibly. And you can simply control those processes a lot better in a farming environment than you can if you're dragging nets out of the ocean. So I think there's some positivity in that area. Uh, do we have another question? Do we have any questions? Uh, yes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your uh, commentary today. Uh, probably to you, Paul. Uh, Peter Belsrani is my name. I'm a corporate advisor based out of Perth, and I've had some involvement with the Barramundi Business in an advisory capacity. I'm just interested in the market challenges. That, there was a conversation about challenges. Just the market challenges of the branding of Barramundi. Uh, as I understand it, there's a lot of um, imported product that comes in as barramundi. There's also issues with, um, with you know, when you export barramundi, you know, creating that Australian brand. These types of things. I'm just interested in your comments on that, Paul. And and, and uh, probably broadly, does mm -hmm. that is that a broader question around the fish species mm -hmm. as well? Because you know, one person's uh, fish species is not necessarily the same across the world and even across states in in Australia. How are you? You know, if we get quick answer, so we can take also more questions from okay. the public. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a, a few questions in there, but uh, look, I think you're right. One of the one of the immediate challenges that we have for barramundi is that barramundi is grown in in different environments within Australia. So we have freshwater and saltwater and uh, land based, and and then in addition to that, two thirds of the barramundi that are sold in Australia are actually imported from from Asia. That's one of our biggest challenges: is that the public simply don't know that and in food service and, and retail, there's still not appropriate um, traceability that is provided to the consumer to understand whether barramundi is grown in Australia or is, is imported. It's a real problem. Uh, we talked about advocacy um, earlier. Uh, the, the bottom line is that food service advocates are stronger than aquaculture advocates at the moment, and we can't get those laws change, or we haven't been successful so far, mm -hmm. in effectively ensuring that the consumers know exactly what they're eating. Mm -hmm. So that's probably our biggest challenge, I think, is, is enabling consumers to differentiate between Australian grown or caught barramundi and imported barramundi. Thank Do we have a question? Yeah. Um, can I, so sorry, can I just jump yes, in quickly sure. there? Um, the Northern Territory Seafood Council ran a really good campaign so that all local restaurants have to label whether their seafood is imported or whether it's local, um, farmed or wild catch. And it's been really popular since it got in. Um, so that's maybe something to look to. Yeah, maybe the officials from the government, state or federal government, you know, might take into their agenda. So uh, please, the question. Yeah, great. So. Um we got, just sort of have a question around uh, the transition to, to plant-based feeds. Um, obviously, um, one of the biggest feedstocks for aquaculture is, is other fish. And so when we talk about it in the, con the, sustainability, uh, sorry, the context of sustainability, uh, one of the big questions, I guess, uh, that remains unanswered is how we're going to sort of scale this sustainable feed. Um, and so the question is around um, 
is there any adverse effects that that might come from uh, flavour or or increased uh, pathogen mm. risk or anything that might be associated with a transition to to plant based feeds? Mm. That's one for the science. Yes, Tim. It's a tough one. Um, so look, basically the the transition. So so twenty thirty years ago, we the world caught. Um, 20, 30 million tonnes of fish that went into fish meal and we fed that all to pigs and chickens back then before we had a big global aquaculture industry. And in the last 30 years, almost all of that product now goes to aquaculture and we don't feed it to chickens and pigs anymore. So point one is, you know, according to that thing we saw there, that's a massive boost in the sustainability of the use of that resource as a starting point. Now as aquaculture grows, it has to spare the fish oil and the fish meal to stretch it further to support the growth. And essentially that, you know, if you go to a conference on, on uh, fish nutrition, there's 500 people that turn up that give papers into the minutiae of how that occurs. So the innovate it's quite technical and difficult for someone like me, but there's enormous innovation in that space. And they are looking at all of those aspects that you're talking about. How do you spare as much? How do you use it at the right times in the feed cycle? What effects does it have on the end product? What, what effects does it have on um, the, the diseases that the fish catch or what they're susceptible to? So that is, you know, there's a global community of people that are working in that space. So I, I can't tell you the answer to that, but the, the innovation space there is enormous. Mm. Yeah, it's been worked on. Yeah, great. I've got another question that's sure. around... Uh, inland uh, aquaculture and uh, so um, interested to hear about uh, your your perspective on the opportunity for inland aquaculture and RAS systems in Australia um, and I guess uh, to add to add to it would be a question around does it have to be a huge scale to make a RAS system in Australia stack up uh, commercially or is there is there models for um, getting in small and scaling up I think um, to answer the last question first, we talked about local um, market opportunities and smaller scale uh, social um, or, or, or markets, you know, based around communities, for instance. In, in that case, absolutely. I think uh, where recirculating aquaculture is at the moment, and, and mainstream is a is a pioneer and a, and a leader in this space, is that um, it's getting close. It commercially, it doesn't stack up against. Uh, other forms of aquaculture. However, uh, it has a very important um, position at the front end of most aquaculture operations. So, uh, for instance, the salmon farms used to grow smolt around about 100, 200 grams and put them out to ocean. They're now growing those smolt to 500 grams, 600 grams, even a kilo. And that's allowed greater asset turnover so they're able to use their cages more quickly and grow more product from bringing, bringing their nurseries on shore. So recirculating aquaculture is at a state now at a, in, a, in a large industry um, mm. perspective where it provides the solution mm. for nurseries um, and to stock larger grow out format operations. We're very bullish and optimistic that it is the way of the future, whether it's next year or five years or 10 years or 20 years, I think more like five or 10, but it's getting there. All right, thanks. Uh, so I think just wrapping up, uh, we heard that the opportunity is there, the potential is great. Uh, of course, there are challenges, but we, we heard that with innovation, becoming more transparent, educating better, better the public, you know, we can really embrace this opportunity. And also, that um, we learned today that uh, in comparison to the other food industry, aquaculture with fish offers a solution now, today, we don't need to wait. So at least, I'm not saying that it's the solution for everything, but at least it is a really good starting point that gives us the opportunity to leverage the market opportunity, bring all, everybody together in the sense that, you know, we can, for the government, you know, create economic growth, jobs, but also, you know, bring people into the uh, sector. And also, uh, with aquaculture, in a sustainable manner, we, we can really uh, you know, uh, aim high because Australia can offer, uh, can, uh, uh, can offer a lot of solutions, especially with all the infrastructure and know-how that we have around. We heard already from the academic and the industry sector that we have 
already good interaction, amazing success. So I think it's more, a, more of a kind of like switch on attitude and talk to the, I mean, talk about the issues, you know, bring innovation. And, you know, I think we, we can make a very good case here to place not just Victoria, but, you know, Australia globally in the sector. So with that, um, I really thank you for coming, to, for participating, and I would like to join me and congratulate the panel. Great. Thanks very much, guys. Um, so I've been having a bit of fun just sort of wrapping up these sessions, uh, doing a bit of a shout out to some of the startups and innovators that you might see out on the floor uh, relating to the topic. Uh, so we've got, we've got one company called Aug Seaweed who you'll see over in the trade area. So go and check them out um, if, you, if you get the chance. Um, I, I also have a call to action though. Um, we, we did a big shout out to uh, the Australian uh, and sort of uh, an Asian startup and food ecosystem to uh, apply to come and pitch at this event and uh, tell us about their startups and, and, and get their, their company out there, uh, particularly those looking to raise, raise some early stage funding. Um, I'm really passionate about aquaculture and think, uh, as, as does the rest of the panel here, I think it has a huge opportunity in Australia and, and the, the, the opportunity for innovation and investment in that space is immense. We didn't get one single ag tech company or food tech company that was had, had anything to do with the, the seafood or aquaculture value chain. So my personal call to action is that when we do a shout out next year uh, for a whole bunch of companies to come and pitch, I would love to see a whole bunch of, uh, of, of startups in that space. So uh, if you are a startup or thinking about getting involved uh, or, or you're an investor thinking about the space, um, then uh, my call to action is, is let's get this thing lit up. Um, Another huge thanks to our panel. Um, we've got uh, a 15-minute break now, and we'll be coming back to talk about uh, indoor farming and vertical agriculture. So another round of applause for Antonio and the panel. Thanks. <laughs>